You too. I'm just going to start out by asking uh, perhaps the obvious question, since we have the honor of having uh, the two of you here. Since this was the first film that you made together, I believe. If you can talk about how you came to work together, if you had met before, and you know this was clearly not the last film you made together. I think you ended up making four films. Um, and if you can talk about just how that started and how it has developed over the years as well. Well, that, that uh, is a great question, Jed. It, it requires almost... Uh, it's an okay question. <laughs> <laughs> it requires almost a, a, an evening of its own to answer. But I'll give you the abbreviated version. Okay. But it's hard to give you the abbreviated version because all the details are really so juicy. i got to go back a little bit to Johnny Swade, which was my first film, which kind of came out after four years of work and death. Okay. I, spent, I spent four years trying to make a film called Box of Moonlight. I had the money, I had the money, I lost the money, I lost the money. I was about to go insane. I went to a wedding of my wife's cousin. She's here tonight. I'll introduce her in a moment. And at this wedding, I proceeded to have three martinis uh, because I was so crazy. And I think I was actually, you know, speaking out during the ceremony. I was so drunk. Uh, and some, some guy comes up to me who had actually been in one of my acting classes four years earlier. And he goes, through the haze, I see this guy come up to me. And he goes, hey, Tom, so great to see you. Man, you're so lucky, man. You, you made a movie. Johnny Sway, lights, camera, action. And I just looked at him and said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> God damn it, man. You don't know the first thing about it hard it is to make a movie, how tedious it is, how, how you can be all primed, you can have an actor, an actress really ready to go, and, and, and every single time you're about to shoot a tape, something goes wrong. And I went, boing, boing, boing. And that's where I got the idea, right there, at that drunken wedding. <laughs> I went home that night, I started writing it, I wrote the first half hour in about four days, gave it to Catherine Keener, who was staying with us for a, a weekend, her laughter from, from the back room where she was reading it was just incredible. She was howling. The first thing she said was, I'm going to give it to my husband, who was Dermot. Dermot immediately said he would put up $5,000 and he wanted to play the director. And I said, ah, Dermot, you know, I want your $5,000, um, but I really, I really see you as a cameraman. And he says, okay, what about Steve Buscemi for the director? Steve got cast. <laughs> That's a long story. But anyway, I, of course, I knew Steve, and uh, it was just a thrill. I, I think, what did I, we called you? And you said, sure, can I read But Tom and I knew each other from uh, days when I used to do performance stuff in the East Village, and we were both uh, uh, friends with people like Jim, Jim Jarmish and Sarah Driver and Betty Gordon, and there was a whole com community of people that were doing uh, theater and music and art and film, and Tom was right in the middle of all, of all that. So, um, yeah, so it was just, uh, it just seemed like a natural thing that we were going to work together eventually. But you did say yes without reading the script. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You said yes, can I read the script? Um, I, I did appreciate the fact that you said yes before reading, Steve. But you probably told me the story a little bit. A little bit, not much. <laughs> But this was a great experience because, contrary to almost any film that ever gets made, the only person who auditioned for a role was Peter Dinklage. And uh, everyone else, anybody who put up money, except Steve, um, got a part in the film. That, that's how I cast it. <laughs> really know what people's take, what each actor's take on the character was going to be until you were on set. I mean, is that... It's absolutely true. <laughs> it's true. And this is a true story. I'm not trying to do anything here other than simply tell the truth. Brad Pitt was, was all set to play Chad Palavino. Okay? This was, it was a go movie with Brad Pitt. He had to pull out at the last minute because of some press commitments to Legends of the Fall. And I was, you know, really upset by it. And I was on the phone with Catherine, who was in her house in, in California. She was sitting by the window. And we were talking about what to do. And she says, hold on a second. And I hear her just yell out, hey, James, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> it was James LeGros walking by on the sidewalk. <laughs> so James LeGros got here. <laughs> and I never knew what he was going to do to the moment he opened his mouth. I, I, I think he does an amazing job in the film. I, you know, I'm just really in 
awe of everything the actors, you know, committed to this movie, especially Steve. It's, I mean, part of what I think is so interesting and what, what makes it really hold up uh, now is be, it's, it's, it's almost less of a narrative and really just kind of, it has a conceptual purity. It's really like just kind of a catalog of every, but seemingly every possible thing that can go wrong. I mean, both for a filmmaker and for the actors. I, I'm wondering how much of this, I'm assuming your mother doesn't think she can, I don't know, should I go there? You know, I'm wondering how much of it is really stuff that you each experienced. I mean, as, a, as an actor, as, a, as, as a director, as an actor, and then Steve, I think you directed your first feature like very, very soon after this. I did. I, I, had, I had the script for Trees Lounge um, while we were shooting this. But, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, I remember at the time people asking me if I, you know, who did I base this character on? And I really didn't base it on anybody. Um, and, I, and I was really able to use my own experiences just from doing that short where I only shot for a weekend where I saw how incredibly hard it is to make a film but in how um, amazing it is once you actually complete it and once you actually put it together and see it you kind of forget the pain that, 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 you, that you went through. I think a lot of the film really rests on just the, those close-ups of, of you and, and there's just something in your eyes, there, there's that hope, there's just this sort of heartbreaking hope every time that, that you know, everything is going gonna, is gonna to work this time and then obviously it you know, tends to be quashed. And what's really funny watching this is that I feel myself getting anxious. Um, <laughs> I just directed an episode of uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And I, find, I found myself at least two or three times a day going, why am I doing this? I'm, so I can't, I'm, I'm not a director. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you go home and you go, yeah, that was all right. <laughs> I think that's what a director goes through, you know, through, through throughout the day. Yeah. Some of the most startling criticism that I got from, for this film came from a strata of the independent film director world. People were not happy with the way I portrayed what it's like to be a director. And I, you know, I, I just knew from the beginning that that's what I wanted to try to do, was to take this cloak of mythology off of what that experience is like. And there was a period in the 90s uh, where the independent film director was looked at as, as like this rock star or something. And, and it went against every frame of reality that I knew. Um, you know, not only from my own films, but films that I had worked on, in which the director was all the time a nervous wreck. And, and, and the battle was how to keep sane. There was never the cool moment, ever. And, and, and it was a constant battle to try to keep your integrity, uh, you know, in a business that just every second sucks it out. <laughs> That's why I was so pleased with what Steve did, because you see in every scene, that Steve never gives up. And that's a rare thing from an actor, to always keep going for something. Look at the scene where Catherine and her mother are actually doing the scene in the rehearsal. And there's Steve watching the scene. And what, what, what so amazes me to this day is, is what's in his face as he's watching it, that, that there is still a, a, a just an aching uh, of enjoyment of what he's watching. And uh, I don't think I ever said anything to you about that, Steve, but uh, to me, that's what makes that scene. Well, thank you, Tom, but I say it's a testament to the writer and, and the director. It's, it was such a beautifully written script, and Tom is so great with actors. Um, you know, this, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Tom wrote this as a short film, and so we were, it was only meant to be a short film, and about the third day into it, the actors, you know, we were all talking, and each one of us went up to Tom, begging him to make it into a feature. And he said, well, let's just get through this, this week. <laughs> and um, and uh, Tom finished the short, you know, he showed it to us, and we loved it, and went to some festivals, and we still, we kept bugging him, bugging him. And uh, I think you wrote the rest of it on a plane or, or something? Yeah, and, the second act on a plane. Second, what yeah. I, uh, I did agree with you. I mean, there was a sense on, on the line. We shot the first half hour uh, for $37,000 in about five, four days, four and a half days. And I could feel that something had happened, was happening, 
that was the best thing that I had ever experienced as a director. And it killed me to think that, it, that you know, a half an hour film, there really wasn't a place for it. So yeah. uh, I racked my brain. I, I said, okay, let's see. If, if I could go to a second part, I figured, well, the first part ends, you know, with Steve waking up. It's a dream. What if, what if I tried to incorporate another dream, you know, someone else? And, and uh, for some reason, I immediately thought of, of a fist fight on, on the set. That, that's what inspired me to come up with part two. Uh, and we, I did write that on the play to, to Rotterdam you know, with, with you there. And I have to give credit to my wife because I was agonizing about part three. I didn't know what it was going to be. And she finally looked at me and she just said, listen, part one is a dream, part two is a dream. Why don't you have part three be them shooting a dream sequence? <laughs> And I immediately thought of um, a dwarf <laughs> throwing, a, throwing a tantrum and saying, you know, go fuck yourself. <laughs> what, so were the second and third parts then filmed all at once? Yes, they were. Yes. But like eight months later. Right. Yeah. There, are, there are two people here tonight that were critical in, in that happening. And the reason I say that is because uh, at one point, I was so desperate to, to get the film financed. Uh, Steve was getting parts, Dermot was getting parts, Catherine, I mean, it was, the time pressure was insane. Uh, and I was about to sign a deal with some guy on the phone in California, and he was telling, telling me, listen man, I'm not, I'm not a hands-off producer. Mm. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna be all over this, you know, we're, we're gonna really beef up the cast, we're gonna do all this. You know, and my call waiting clicked in. And it was my wife's cousin whose wedding I had been at. Okay? And whom I had given a part in the film. Okay? And she called me with her husband at the time and said, Tom, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you, uh, but would you mind if I finance the film? <laughs> <laughs> and she's here tonight. She played the part of the script supervisor. Will Hillary please stand up? <laughs> There's Michael. He plays Speed Up. Oh, speed up. We were able to finish the film without any producers, without anybody on the set. Uh, so uh, that's just one other person I'd like to, uh, also who was crucial in this film. Uh, the, the casting director, Marsha Shulman. Is Marsha here? Stand up, Marsha. say about Marsha. Marsha uh, introduced me to Peter Dinklage. He was the one guy who, you know, who auditioned. And someone had heard of him. I, I stupidly thought that, that anybody, you know, two feet tall could do that part. That's how stupid I was. Marsha brought in Peter. Marsha also was responsible for introducing me to Catherine Keener and to Brad Pitt and to Sam Rockwell. So, Marsha should <laughs> <laughs> Peter, is, is he still acting? No, I'm kidding. He's a short order book. Frank Prinzi, is Frank here? Frank? Frank Prinzi, the director of photography, did an amazing, amazing job. Yeah. Just one more from me before I turn it over. I'm just curious if there were, were there any uh, horrible, did anything go horribly wrong on the shoot of Living in Oblivion? Seriously, I don't remember anything that went horribly wrong, and, but I tell you, every movie that I've worked on since then, um, especially when I'm directing anything, like uh, and I, lately I've been directing a lot of TV stuff, there comes a moment where there's a beeping sound. It's, it's followed me through every. Uh, there's always a beeping sound, and I'm always wondering, like it's like the crew, you know, doing a practical joke. Are you sure it's in reality? It's not just. It's not in my head. I mean, I can walk through walls, but. I mean, uh, I'm sure people have questions. Who has a question?